raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and to pull up a chair as we gather together right here in our very favorite corner of that hallowed hall of archaeology, the Cross Time Pub. And of course, this week we will be analyzing ancient stone for evidence of the long-preserved blood of Ice Age mammals and much more. So it's going to be a good time as always. Always great to see these two gentlemen joining me right here, ponying up at the Cross Time Pub and its very extensive, newly improved and renovated bar, James Waldo and Jason Pentrail. Now, especially in the case of James Waldo, geologist extraordinaire, I think this is one of those rare instances where, if you look closely, I've got more facial hair than you do, sir. Yeah, you actually do. Uh, it, <laughs> it's just too hot for a beard, I've decided. I've got a lot, a lot of uh, outdoor projects this year, and... Uh, Man, I just, I just couldn't hang. Uh, that beard kind of put some years on me. There's a lot of gray in it. If I shave it off, uh, people always comment how much younger I look without it. Oh, that's true. But, you know, I also like the beard. Frankly, if I could grow one, I would probably have one, too. But everybody's like, you know, Mikey, you're getting to that age. You're in your 40s now. Maybe a little stubble, a little facial hair would help you. And I'm like, look, if you saw what happens when I try to grow a beard, you'd see why <laughs> I keep it shaven. <laughs> Trust me, I tried again recently. Every few years I try... And I'm still just going to have to keep going with the uh, the shaven look, unless I just want to do like a very, very thin goatee and a mustache, because that's pretty much the only place on my face where the hair will grow. <laughs> you should, uh, uh, oh, what was the famous uh, UFO researcher? What, what was the guy's name? Jay oh, Allen Hynek. Jay Allen Hynek, yes. Yep. You, do the, you could do the Hynek. Yeah, that would probably be a good look for me. I've already got the glasses, don't I? Yeah, you do. You do. <laughs> Jason, what's going on in your world, pal? Oh, you know, just, uh, well, you know, facial hair, uh, it's one of those things, you know, I've got about a year left before I can officially retire from a government service, we'll say. And uh, then I will once again regain control over things like haircuts and facial hair. Uh, I think I'm going to grow myself one of those uh, Pringle can mustaches and just uh, get ridiculous with it. I can't do the beard because I don't have any hair up top. So it just doesn't look right when you have the beard with no hair. So, uh, yeah, I'll do, I'll do one of those big, uh, ridiculous mustaches for a couple of weeks and I'll probably shave it off. But other than that, I'm staying busy with the Patreon, uh, campaign, doing a lot of stuff for that. Uh, lots of books here yet to read. Uh, I did have to go out of town recently, uh, down to Miami to work for a week. And, uh, that quiet time provided me the opportunity to finally finish one whole book. So of the about 300 that I'm surrounded by, I was happy to finally make just a little bit of leeway and get one whole book actually completed. So I'm pretty stoked about it. Now, may I ask what the book was that you read? Uh, it was called Hypatia of Alexandria. So it's talking about a uh, very famous uh, philosopher, female philosopher there who met an untimely end. Uh, in the streets of Alexandria, but uh, very interesting. And uh, it was nice to actually be able to read something from cover to cover for once. You know, I'm reading a book about geography, which sort of has to do with our fascination with maps in the ancient world. But this isn't a book about ancient geography. No, this is a book about very modern geography. In fact, I'll tell you the name. It's Trevor Paglin's book, Blank Spots on the Map. And it's all about the what he calls dark geography of the intelligence community with satellite and geospatial data, slightly different take on geography than the kind that we would probably talk about on this program, but again, a very relevant one in the current environment, especially when it comes to national defense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, all of those things are uh, very interesting, to say the least. I've always loved geography, and speaking of which, let's take it over to France, because we've got a breaking story here that I found to be very, very interesting. It's applicable both to the history there, but also to many things that we see happening here in the United States. Uh, this is coming from artnet.com, and the title of the article is French Archaeologists Decry the Loss of 7,000-Year-Old Standing Stones on a Site That Was Destroyed to Make Way for a Do-It-Yourself Store. 
So dozens of prehistoric standing stones in Karnak, uh, which is a town in Brittany. If you've never seen Karnak, uh, there's a lot of documentaries or some great videos. It's an absolutely incredible standing stone, stone site. It doesn't get as much recognition as some of the other ones like Avebury, Stonehenge, places like that. But it is truly a remarkable site. So this is where we're picking up here. So that's in northwest France. Uh, there they have... Uh, several standing stones that have been removed to make way for this retail store. Debate is raging among historians, politicians, and cultural authorities as to whether this constitutes damage to a site of archaeological value. The site has been destroyed, according to local archaeologist uh, Christian Oblitz. Uh, he stated this back on June 7th of this year. According to Oblitz, the uh, 39 menhirs, which is the term that they use for these standing stones, uh, they were up to 40 inches high and they were lost. They are estimated to date back some 7,000 years based on carbon dating conducted uh, back in 2010. The local mayor's office did grant a building permit back in August of 2022 for a store to be put there uh, by a chain in that area called Mr. Bricko Lodge, which sells home improvement and do-it-yourself goods and has a store that's currently under construction on this site. Uh, Isabel Chardonnay, director of the Regional Directorate of Cultural Affairs in Brittany, attempted to clarify the reality, telling News in France that only four of the 39 stones potentially had archaeological value. As for 39 of the valuable objects being destroyed, she said the reality is absolutely not that. The office said that some of the men here had previously been moved, meaning that it was not a historical arrangement. Mayor Olivier Lepic told uh, French News that he adhered to the law and that inspections had found items to be of low archaeological value. The land in question is not a protected archaeological site, though it is near one. For his part, Oblitz thinks local authorities did not do their due diligence. Quote, they weren't archaeological excavations in order to know if the stones or were menhirs or not, is what he's saying to French News. Um, Karnak, the Brittany region, is known for grand fields of megaliths. There's some 3,000 of them standing in two protected areas near that uh, particular spot that stretch over four miles. The exact purpose of the standing stone still remains unknown, but some theories suggest sacred or funeral purposes. In any case, according to the regional directorate, the damage to the site of archaeological value has not been established. Uh, the do-it-yourself store uh, quotes since they sincerely regret the situation so there we have it uh, again you know this is one of those things that kind of you know is it is it not but the idea that um, something that close even to a protected site and something as remarkable as Karnak uh, to be kind of destroyed in order to put up something so menial I think certainly upsets a lot of folks Oh, for sure. And, you know, if you look at those men here, those famous standing stones around Karnak, not to be confused with the Karnak, a similar sounding name, but that relative to a location in Egypt. I mean, one of the most fascinating things to me is how they managed to stand all those stones upright. Now, I mean, if you've got a maybe a stone that's five or six feet tall when it's standing, that's one thing. But the broken men here, have you guys ever seen that one? Yes, I have. Yep, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, the broken men here, it's broken into three slabs because, I mean, it was a massive. I mean, Jason, if you had to estimate, like, maybe how many yards tall would you guess that thing probably was? If I had to estimate, I would say around probably 20 yards. Yeah, that sounds about right, I think. In other words, folks, it's really, really tall. And somehow in the ancient world, using probably pulleys and ropes and things, they, were, they managed to stand this huge stone upright. And eventually it fell over at some point and split into three shards that still lay on the ground. But you look at that thing knowing that at one point it stood upright, this massive obelisk in the ancient world. Things like that just absolutely fascinate me about not only places in France and throughout Europe where Neolithic sites are still preserved to this day, but really all throughout the ancient world. So that's some fascinating stuff and indeed very sad what you're describing right there, Jason. You know, it makes me wonder um, what kind of uh, uh, regulations that the European Union has uh, in regards to this type of thing. You know, in the United States, uh, if you're going to develop a piece of property, even if it's well, especially for commercial purposes, a lot of times that type of thing is taken into consideration. And there's some there's some front end work that, that gets done. And, and uh uh, and then, you know, maybe you can build and maybe you can't. Uh, and, I, and I would suspect that the European Union has some type of regulation. And you would think that the developers, whoever they were, 
had followed those regulations and, you know, had satisfied their due diligence requirements. And, you know, perhaps the local uh, person that's, uh, you know, upset about this is maybe possibly making more out of it than it is. You know, that that kind of stuff uh, occurs from time to time. I'm not saying that they are, but sometimes the truth lies somewhere somewhere in the middle. Um also, I'm curious, what's a do-it-yourself store? Is that like a hardware store? Does anybody know? I'd imagine, yeah. Yeah. So, DIY. Yeah. Yeah, but maybe just not the kind of thing that should outweigh preserving our ancient heritage. You know, another way we're learning about our ancient past and our heritage is not so much through the remains of physical sites, structures, and things along those lines, but the actual people who once existed at those locations. Case in point, a new study published recently in Science Advances is using ancient DNA to find out conclusively uh, who these workers were that were found buried more than 500 years ago within what is, of course, recognized as the Lost Inca Empire, one of the most talked about locations really in the history of archaeology. I'm looking right now at a press release from Tulane University where they say that researchers, including Jason Nesbitt, he's associate professor of archaeology at Tulane University School of Liberal Arts, they've performed genetic testing on individuals that were found buried at Machu Picchu, another place I'd love to go, by the way, have not been there, fully intend to go at some point. But they've looked at these individuals and their DNA in order to learn more about the people who lived and worked there. Now, of course... Those who have been to Machu Picchu will know it's truly impressive. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's located in a region known as Cuzco in Peru, arguably one of the most well-known archaeological sites in the world. But again, it just shows how much we know versus how little we know about those who actually live there. So this DNA analysis aimed to shed some light on that, and much in the same way that modern genetic ancestry kits, you know, you've taken the little spit tests, some of you out there, to find out about your own genetic heritage. They were doing something kind of similar. According to this press release, the researchers compared the DNA of 34 individuals buried at Machu Picchu to that of individuals from other places around the Inca Empire, and also with relation to modern genomes from South America, just to basically see how closely related they might be. And here is what the results found. The DNA analysis showed that the individuals had come from throughout the Inca Empire, some as far away as Amazonia. Few of them, they said, shared DNA with each other, showing that they had been brought to Machu Picchu as individuals rather than as a part of a family or community group. Now, that's kind of interesting because if you think about similar genetic studies that have been carried out elsewhere, I mean, it's strongly suggestive that locations in the ancient world where we once might have thought of them as being a little more insular, that's not necessarily the truth. People would come from all around Cahokia in North America. That's probably one of those kind of locations. And of course, as we've seen, Archaeological and other evidence seems to support the idea at a number of other sites throughout North America that there were people probably coming up from Mesoamerica in pre-Columbian times and that there was trade occurring. So indeed, this idea that people kind of only resided in one area and they stayed put, they didn't engage in trade, they didn't travel, that had once been a prevalent idea, and especially in American anthropology, we're now finding that in South America and North America, that wasn't really so much the case, and new genetic information is also revealing that about Machu Picchu, and more broadly, the Inca Empire. So I was interested in this term, uh, retainer, uh, in regards to the population area, and I, I, scan, I scanned through the paper and did a quick search for it, and it turns out re the retainer population appears to re refer to uh, almost like maintenance staff or hospitality staff that 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 mans or or, or uh, maintains the sites even during peak season and off season. So, interesting choice of terms, but there you go. Yeah, well, now we know, and we'll have that linked in the show notes, the science paper, as well as the news release, and of course, links to all the stories we've been talking about in this opening segment. You know, we got to get into a conversation here shortly with one of our very favorite guests, Dr. Chris Moore. Before we get into that, Jason, you want to give us a quick update about what's been going on over on the Patreon page. Well, Patreon's continuing to grow, and we're very happy to see that growth. Uh, again, we're lining up some great guests. We've just released a couple new episodes of the Crosstime Pub. I've got some great candidates coming up for the Dig Deeper podcast. And, of course, we always have the Green Dragon Book Club. We're having a lot of fun with that. So uh, lots of different products there to offer you uh, in addition to what you see here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So if that's something that you'd be interested in, just head over to Patreon, type in Seven Ages Audio Journal. It'll pop up and you'll see all of 
the various tiers that we have for you to enjoy. And again, as always, we thank everyone who has came over and supported us. It means a great deal to us. It allows us to get out and do what we love to do best, audio journaling from the road. And we're hoping, you know, in the near future that we can get all of us back together again, even if it's for a weekend and get back out there on the road and uh, bring you some of the very best interviews and live uh, presentations, if you will, from the world of archaeology. So hoping to get back out there with you guys. That'd be a lot of fun. One thing, though, Jason, we might have to wait until autumn because, well, as you know, it's been a busy summer, I think, for everybody, especially me. But the summer heat, man, I don't want to be down there digging in that uh, ancient Pleistocene terrace in this kind of heat. That is for sure. No, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I probably shouldn't have mowed the grass before I came and did the show tonight. That's okay. Don't worry. My neighbors all seem to think it's a good time to mow the grass later in the day, hence why there may be a strange rumbling noise off in the distance. Those aren't mystery booms. That's just a very loud lawnmower, ladies and gents. But with all that in mind, I mentioned again that we've got a great guest, a longtime friend, recurring appearance by him, too. On the program tonight, Dr. Christopher Moore, a geoarchaeologist who really is a man who wears many hats. We've spent a lot of time down there in South Carolina volunteering on a dig site. He has worked for many, many years. That's known as White Pond. And of course, longtime listeners will know its relevance to the Pleistocene landscape that we have been so long interested in on this program. But I got to tell you, some truly incredible advancements in science. This not unlike some of the stuff we were discussing about the Inca Empire and how new analysis techniques are revealing clues about the ancient past. Well, Chris Moore has been deeply involved in recent efforts involving blood protein analysis of ancient lithic samples that have been collected from North and South Carolina, and these are all from the Paleo-Indian period, so this is a very interesting study. It reveals for the first time and to the greatest extent what the ancient people who lived in this part of the world were hunting with those stone tools that we, of course, know so well. We're going to learn all about this from a new paper that Chris has published when we return here in a moment, right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. We're happy to welcome back to the Seven Ages Audio Journal a former guest and friend, Christopher R. Moore. You've heard him on several of our previous podcasts, both on Patreon and here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Chris is a research professor at the South Carolina Institute for Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of South Carolina. Chris received his bachelor's in anthropology from Appalachian State University in 1997 and his master's in anthropology from East Carolina University in 2000. His PhD in coastal resources management with a focus in geoscience was also received from East Carolina University in 2009. Chris's research interests include geoarchaeology, early hunter-gatherers, late quaternary climate and human adaptation and blood residue analysis. So once again, Chris, welcome back to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, you know, we talk a lot behind the scenes, and I know that you've always got a lot going on. You've always got interesting research, and uh, we're always chatting back and forth about all the cool things that you got going on. But this particular project that just came out in uh, Scientific Reports via Nature, this is at nature.com. Uh, it was published on June the 10th, 2023, and I see that it's making its rounds around all of the sites that I follow. There's a lot of buzz around this one, and I'm really happy to have you back on tonight to talk about this uh, latest paper, Paleo-American Exploitation of Extinct Megafauna Revealed Through Immunological Blood Residue and Microware Analysis, North and South Carolina, USA. Now, that's a lot to take in, and we're going to break down all the details tonight, but it is a state-of-the-art process, if you will, that's, uh, again, changing the way that we look at archaeology. Now, we talk a lot about the advances in science, the advances in technology, and all the great things that we're seeing throughout the world of archaeology and scientific research, and I think this only adds to that growing field that we see getting bigger and bigger every single year. So first of all, congratulations on this research. Again, I was very happy uh, for you and the team that you had here on board uh, when I saw this come out. And so uh, again, congratulations. Thank you. 
All right. So it's a uh, it's a big one, Chris. We're uh, we've had you on before. We've talked about some of the younger driest stuff, some of the comet research stuff, all sorts of different things that you're involved with. Uh, but this is something that maybe a lot of people haven't really kept up with and maybe haven't heard as much about. So right. uh, immunological blood residue, uh, when we say that, what exactly are we talking about, first of all? Well, it's a method that's been applied in forensics and crime scene investigation for decades, uh, maybe 60 years or more now, and basically... You know, I'm not a, an expert in the actual method itself, but it's a method for identifying blood residues by using uh, antisera, in, in my case, from modern living animals, right? And so it's immunoelectrophoresis. So that's, you know, a lot of that is over my head in terms of exactly how it works, but the extraction of residues from the stone tools, I think I've developed a little bit of an understanding about how that's possible since my early work in 2016 at Flamingo Bay, at least theoretically and, and also experimentally, it appears that proteins or, or uh, residues of protein, blood proteins, are in the right context are tenacious. They, they can survive extremely long periods of time. Um, I was reading something recently that talks about they, proteins have been found in dinosaur bones, dinosaur eggs. So, and these are, you know, these are not the full formed proteins, but they're, there's a term linear epitopes that's, that's used to describe these protein, uh, linear uh, protein fragments. And I guess theoretically, and even experimentally, this has been done when, when a stone is flaked in the production of a stone tool, a projectile point or a knife, uh, micro fractures are produced in the stone itself. And dur- during use, of that stone, probably just maybe the first few times it's being used, those micro fractures are filled with blood, uh, fats, tissues, lipids, and those get sealed over very quickly over time. And, uh, you know, by additional fatty tissues and maybe even uh, post depositionally when they're after they're used by sediments, clays can fill in and seal and preserve these residues. Essentially, what would be uh, you know, you, you hear a lot about archaeology in certain settings, like in caves. You can get good preservation of things, right? This is analogous to that in a way, I think. You, you're protecting and preserving uh, these proteins inside of the rock, essentially, in these microfractures. And I know initially when I first looked into this, and, and, and like many archaeologists are, that are skeptical of this method, you go, how is this possible? You know, how could blood protein be preserved on stone tools. And, you know, after I started looking into it, I think this is the explanation. We're not talking about a blood stain, you know, on the spear point, you know, that's gone. This is, is fascinating in so many ways. And, and we are really going to get into some of the details tonight as you cover here in the paper. But first, uh, James, what do you think about that? Being a professional geologist, uh, how it's described there with those micro fractures and, and various other uh, forms that we see on some of these lithics. Uh, does that make sense from a geological perspective? Short answer is yes, but I've got, obviously I've got a lot of questions, you know, some detailed questions about, um, you know, what, what kind of environments are most conducive to this? Is it kind of a wide range of uh, yeah. settings that, you know, these things can happen in, or is it very specific? Is it, you know, is it, you know, high clay environments where, you know, the depositional environment is, is such that it kind of lends itself to that? Or are the proteins so robust, you know, in the, in the kind of the just right way yeah. that across a lot of environments, you can still extract this information. Anecdotally, from the work that I've done, my original work from 2016 at Flamingo Bay, and then this much larger study, I mean, we've got results on artifacts that were found right off the surface. Hmm. And again, we're talking about, you know, quite often let, you know, 20% or less of the artifacts that we test have anything. So there probably is something going on uh, in various contexts that, that don't allow for preservation of right. these proteins. Um, right. But it does sound like just the, the proteins themselves are, are, are super robust for long periods of time. I mean, yeah. for, for this to happen at all is kind of astounding, honestly. Right. I mean, I think, you know, if uh, we talk about it in the paper, you know, you know, some of the critics have said, well, you know, if you're, 
you can have uh, artifacts, you know, in surface contacts may be exposed to animal urine or more recent animal blood, you know, that kind of thing. And we can't completely rule that out. Um, but we argue that, you know, that stuff, urine and blood, you know, has extremely small, urine especially has almost no of you know, the types of proteins that were detected in this through crossover immunoelectrophoresis. But even the blood, you know, that gets in soil, it's attacked immediately by microbes. And experiments show that it doesn't last more than a few years at most before it's completely gone. And uh, so you're right. I think it, there have to, there have to be the only way we're getting this preservation is by getting you know some of this material, the blood proteins, into these fractures and then having them sealed over over time. Yeah, it all makes it makes great sense. And again, we're, they really describe all of this process in the paper. But Chris, you've mentioned it a couple times. So before we get into the specifics tonight and really break down uh, some of the, the items here in the paper, let's go back to Flamingo Bay, because I know uh, from conversations with you over the years that this was a pretty big deal. So take us back to where is Flamingo Bay? What type of environment is that? And what information and artifacts were you able to extract from that area? Uh, Flamingo Bay is at Carolina Bay on the Savannah River site in Aiken County, South Carolina. Uh, Savannah River site is a Department of Energy installation. And I worked there for a number of years on the sand rim of the bay, of the Carolina Bay, uh, with Mark Brooks and other archaeologists, uh, where we found a, a, a Clovis site. It was probably the first, possibly the first in situ Clovis excavated from a Carolina Bay rim, as far as I know. And through that work, through a number of seasons, I guess the idea for attempting blood residue came from actually looking at uh, uh, the appendix in the original Cactus Hill report that Joe McAvoy and and others uh, put out. They, they actually he actually did uh, some of the earliest blood residue that I know of in the Eastern U.S. in the '90s with Margaret Newman, who did the original work that you know that that I did. She was sort of a pioneer in terms of using it for stone tools. But it didn't get any attention. It was just sort of thrown in the appendix. And he didn't, you know, the, he didn't identify megafauna the way that, you know, extinct megafauna, that the way that I did in the recent study. Um, he, he identified bovid, evidence of bison, which was a common theme. And I thought, this is, you know, why is, why are we not doing more of this? You know, so I got really interested and I was working at Flamingo anyway, several times a year, weeks at a time. And we would open up large excavation blocks. We had everything from Mississippian to Clovis at this site. It was fairly shallow, but uh, but we went in, you know, and I had the idea, we're going to excavate. We're going to get artifacts from out of Flamingo Bay that have not, that we won't touch. And we won't wash, we won't handle and send those for residue. That was the very first analysis. At least part of the tools that we tested were those that were dug up, that were in buried contacts that were never never handled or never touched. You know, to get around sort of the idea that maybe all, maybe everything is contaminated. You know, maybe that's why we're seeing things. And so, and I did that and we sent, we, we got the results and one of the things that jumped out right away was uh, this Large uh, bifacial knife um, at Flamingo Bay came back positive for bovid, which, you know, was really quite interesting. got my attention. Uh, we didn't find any evidence of megafauna, extinct megafauna, you know, proboscidean or horse or camel or anything like that. But we, uh, but bison, you know, certainly in the original study was a common, probably the most common in the early Paleo-Indian artifacts that I tested, that was the one that kept coming up over and over again. Another thing that I like to relate to people is that at Flamingo Bay, we are finding, or we were finding small polished stones that we figured out over time were gastroliths or gizzard stones from burps, right? And we were finding massive numbers of them, large, large numbers of these uh, gizzard stones in the site. So it was very clear that uh, one of the activities at the site uh, was intensive harvesting of birds, waterfowl, other, you know, uh, land birds. I mean, just uh, who knows. But 
the interesting part is the original blood residue study, uh, Margaret Newman did the work for me. She didn't know what we were finding, but we got bird residues back. We got wild turkey. Uh, we've got quail and grouse and that kind of thing, or related species. And that's something that you see often in this method. You don't always get the, the, the uh, residue that comes back is not, is doesn't give a species necessarily. It gives, you know, a family uh, type of identification. Sure. Yeah. But so we got, we got related species that, you know, that were consistent with what we were finding at Flamingo Bay in terms of the gizzard stones. And so Chris at Flamingo Bay, how many would you say artifacts uh, were actually tested from that particular site? Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm trying to remember. I probably have that written down here somewhere. I think I'll talk about it at Flamingo Bay. I don't remember the exact number. I think we had numbers of positive results where I think are about 26%, which is pretty hot. It is, um, yeah. Actually. But, yeah, we did a number of artifacts, paleo, Indian, Clovis, material, scrapers, uh, end scrapers, early archaic points. And then we extended that to include a small number of other spear points from other contexts, Clovis points, uh, Dalton points, early archaic points, you know, the whole gamut from collections, private collections. And so, yes, those were, you know, those were, had been handled and washed and that kind of thing. But we did, we did test those in addition and got, again, the most interesting thing that we got on those original, original tools were clear evidence of intensive hunting, heart, you know, butchering of bison. Uh, that's that, that was the one clear picture. And of course, the thing that stuck with me is, you know, where are the, where are the other megafauna? You know, we, yeah. we didn't find it in that first study. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, you know, there's so much to consider, but before we get into the rest of the details, James, what do you have? So I was just kind of curious about the context at Flamingo Bay for the, you know, for the, for the sites where the artifacts came from are these like hunting camps or is this like kind of a semi-permanent uh settlements or you know just temporary camps of some kind or do you know i mean it varies through time middle archaic period there's uh a lot of uh evidence of that time period from it things like charred hickory nut you know we've got to, with a lot of processing we find a lot of uh broken uh, grinding stones hammer stones you know, from that time period, the Paleo Indian component was fairly ephemeral. I'm sure it was a short-term habitat, short-term camp, a hunting processing camp of some kind. But beyond that, I think the most we can say is, you know, we certainly in the middle archaic, late archaic woodland, we start seeing more evidence of longer-term occupation, just like we do most places, right? And certainly in the middle archaic, more intensive processing of hickory nut. And that was we we did a lot of a lot of radiocarbon dating at Flamingo Bay, hoping to maybe get something that would date us, you know, to the Clovis time period. But we kept getting uh, middle archaic dates, you know, seventy five hundred, eight thousand years, things like that on Hickory Hill. Yeah, but even though I mean that still gives a great insight to the site over time, and I think I think that's just as fascinating as anything else. Let me ask you this, Chris, is the the testing of the blood residue at a site like Flamingo Bay, is the intent to look for those extinct species or is it trying to show that on a Clovis implement, there would have been something from an extinct species that transitions into bison antiquus or something like that? Is it is it sort of meant to be a transitional information gathering or is it just whatever data you can get? I mean, I think it was whatever we could get. I mean, I, I certainly was interested to see if we were going to get any uh, clear extinct megafauna. You know, the bison that we're getting, you know, it's uh, the bovid positive residue. That's you know, for during for paleo, that's probably bison antiquus, but we can't really say. And this immunological method doesn't tell us that. Uh, it doesn't get us to that level. So it's it's uh, either bison antiquus or bison bison. And certainly we've got probably a little bit of both from Flamingo Bay and from other sites that we've looked at. Yeah, again, this is fascinating, and I I think this is uh, uh, really the future for archaeology. But we would be remiss if we don't sort of look at the other side of that. So I do want to read from 
the article that you uh, have published here, quote, several studies have cast doubt on the reliability and accuracy of CIEP results with skepticism concerning the survivability of animal proteins for long periods and the ability of CIEP to identify those residues. This criticism notwithstanding, proteins recovered on archaeological and experimental stone tools have been found to be tenacious with protein derivatives preserved within stone microfractures and linear epitopes. Experimental studies show that microfractures produced during stone tool manufacture rapidly absorb proteins due to capillary uptake during tool use. Now, I find that to be very, very interesting um, because as we discussed at the beginning here, uh, those microfractures and those areas are able to uh, withhold some of what uh, some of what is described here as those tenacious blood derivatives. So, so the blood gets into these microfractures, um, especially with something like uh, coastal plains chert or something that could tend to have more of those uh, small structures that can hold things, uh, fossilist uh, type material that might yeah. have the ability to hold that better. So as far as that ability goes, are these all land finds so you're not removing anything from a river system or a creek uh, if it's been submerged in water does it still have the ability to have that patina that covers it for protection or are these all dry land finds i think this recent study we did i, I can't speak some of the points that we tested um were donated you know decades ago to the institute of archaeology at, 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 at the university um so it's possible some of those were found in creeks or rivers, uh, they, none of them had a, a distinctive river patina that would necessarily tell us that. Uh, I know I've talked to people that have done this, you know, method from my earlier work, and they were concerned that there would be less preservation for artifacts that had been submerged, you know, in in rivers or, or, or streams, you know, for long periods of time. But I don't think we know. I think if we, you know, if these things are, or within the microfractures the way we think, I I think it's certainly probably highly probable that some of them would produce positive reactions. As a general rule, I have tried to use terrestrial uh, excavated or surface finds uh, only and not use points found in rivers. Yeah, certainly that makes sense. James? So backing up just a little bit to where uh, Jason was kind of uh, giving the kind of the last intro uh, and the header, there was a briefest mention of capillary action. And I I thought it was kind of, I thought that was an interesting point. And those that don't know what capillary action is, is when you think about the blood kind of splashing or getting onto the material on the, the artifact itself, it doesn't just lie on the surface and somehow be preserved forever on this glassy surface of, of this chert or flint or whatever, it gets absorbed into the material itself through capillary action. I don't know, Chris, you want to ex- expand on that maybe a little bit, but. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I think you've described it. I, I mean, I think probably the, the activity itself, you know, the, the, the hunting, you know, the uh, use of a projectile certainly, but, but probably more so the butchering process you know, right. an animal is going to, is going to help facilitate that capillary uptake and the absorption of of fatty you know tissues and lipids and proteins. We're not it's not just blood right. uh, that we're talking about. Uh, that's going to you know push you know through force of action itself is going to push that material embedded deeply into some of the microfractures, hin- even hinge fractures, right on an edge of a tool. You sure. know uh, that don't completely peel off. When you're when you're napping the spear point, uh, th- those areas may be areas where some of these proteins are being preserved. Right, right, and, and I think that's probably the most important process in the whole thing is the capillary action of the material itself being able to pull, you know, pull these materials in, and then and then you know they ultimately get preserved and can be analyzed later down the road, 10, 12, yeah. 13, 14,000 years later. Right, right, right. So, yeah, and that's the only thing we mentioned in the paper. We Again, uh, there's been some experimental work on this, certainly where they've actually made tools, used them, and looked at them under a microscope. Uh, but I feel like these fractures probably get filled uh, fairly quickly, uh, and then after which there may be much more limited opportunity to get additional residues, which is another reason we argue it's less likely that they're being contaminated 
um, even in surface context, because these yeah. fractures, microfractures are already filled and have right. been for millennia. That's actually a really good point. I, I didn't think about that till right now, but it makes perfect sense. And on the large scale of things, if you think about how much uh, contact these implements would have had in a butchering situation with blood and all of the other proteins there, uh, certainly with all those micro fractures, it would make sense that some of them uh, would hold to that to some degree. Uh, now, I, before we get into the, the fine details of the paper, which we're about to do, Chris, I have one more piece that I want to discuss, one more artifact, because for me, it was my first introduction to blood protein uh, residues, which is the famous White Pond Dalton. So uh, again, I want to touch on that. We've talked about it a little bit in the yeah. past, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, that particular artifact, uh, where it was found uh, in the context in which it was found, and then what was discovered about it down the road. Yeah, the Dalton Point was found at White Pond during uh, our early excavations there. Um, we were digging along the, you know, on the shoreline there, and uh, I forget the exact depth. I think it was approximately a meter below surface. Uh, we encountered um, this beautiful uh, in situ Dalton point made out of ortho quartzite. Immediately, uh, we collected it. But again, having just fairly recently finished the work in Flamingo uh, blood residue study, you know, I didn't want to touch it. I didn't want to wash it. So we we bagged it up without touching it with our hands without doing anything to it. And we had that one and a few other artifacts that we sent for blood residue analysis. And that point actually was the only one that's come back with positive for human, which actually hasn't been published. I think I've mentioned it in uh, the SCIA newsletter, perhaps in the legacy, but we haven't published that information. So, you know, that could be from you know, perhaps from my own experience of flint napping, it's pretty easy to cut yourself. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of, you know, potential ways that I guess that human blood, human proteins can wind up in a tool. But that was that was what that one produced. Uh, yeah. Quite interesting. Yeah, and a, and a beautiful artifact it is for sure. Uh, you can find some photographs of that on our Facebook. But uh, yeah, so Chris, it's either, uh, you know, the blood of the maker or the world's oldest murder weapon. We'll have to. Uh, <laughs> right, we'll have right. To. That was sort of the what we were, you know thought about when we got that result. I was not expecting that result necessarily. And, and I will say for this recent study, I did not have human was not one of the things we tested for. And that was on purpose because all of these had been handled so much. Um, sure. Yeah, that so makes sense. Yeah, you, it, you know, it would have been interesting to see, but uh, you know, we, we, given that they were handled, particularly the you know Clovis points for decades, uh, people are going to look at, people are going to handle them. You know, I thought that you know it wouldn't really be worth having human blood residue uh, looked for on those. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, so let's get into the paper now. Let's get into the specifics. We've we've talked a lot about uh, various parts of it, but we want to get into the artifacts themselves that were tested. Before we get into those specific artifacts, again, I want to read from the paper, quote, the lack of blood residue evidence for extinct megafauna from earlier southeastern studies is perplexing, but may simply be related to the limited number of artifacts tested. So with that limited number that we've talked about previously, let's get into what we used here on the paper. So 120 artifacts gathered from across North and South Carolina. Uh, these are coming from local county museums, military installations, universities, and of course, private collections. So tell me a little bit about, Chris, how did you choose these particular artifacts? How did you gather them together? And uh, kind of what was your approach to that? Well, you know, with any Paleo-Indian artifacts um, that we're looking for in South Carolina, we're, we're limited in, in a way to where we can find them. Uh, certainly very limited in terms of Clovis or other Paleo-American artifacts from excavated or in situ context. That's very limited. Uh, in South Carolina and North Carolina, it's virtually non-existent. So I went around anywhere I could could find access to particularly large collections. For example, in Hampton County, South Carolina, uh, there was a, a large collection that was donated by one individual who collected for decades uh, in several counties uh, around the church quarries in South Carolina that had numerous paleo points. So I was able to, to use all of those 
Uh, I went around to, ver- like you said, various other local museums, um, military installation, Fort Jackson, obviously the uh, University of South Carolina, the Southeastern Paleo-American Survey uh, with Al Goodyear, who runs the Fluted Point Survey for South Carolina, had a large number of paleo points that I was able to get access to immediately. So, you know, you can't be picky when you're trying to assemble a large collection of paleo points for this kind of study. If I could have, I would have said, we're only going to test, you know, Clovis points, other Paleo-American points from buried, excavated context. But that would have been so limited um, that I, you know, would have gotten very few results. No, that's totally understandable. James? So, a couple of questions. One, of all the, and I I know it's in the paper, but for the, for the, uh, Listeners, a total uh, of the points, how many actually had uh, positive blood residue for anything, really? And then secondly, were points from different regions more apt to have, you know, was the 20% more concentrated someplace else or was it evenly distributed? Well, I'd answer the second question first. I think it was, I didn't, I don't necessarily see a pattern uh, geographically to, to the positive uh, re- residue hits. I mean, out of out of the 120 uh, paleo artifacts that mostly points, but a couple of scrapers um, that we tested for the extinct megafauna, we got a total of 18 uh, positive reactions, and that includes five for proboscidean, uh, which you know we presume is mammoth or mastodon, uh, uh, four for equidae or horse which is kind of interesting because you don't hear that being talked about very much. Uh, you know, we're talking about the Ice Age horse, presumably, that, that went extinct along with the proboscideans. And from what I understand, it was a smaller smaller species, maybe the size of a zebra, that went extinct, uh, you know, they were around that same time. So we've got four tools that had, that had evidence of horse hunting or butchery on those. And then, of course, the consistent pattern that we've seen in every study is the most residues were for bovid. We have nine uh, tools that came back positive for, for bovid, uh, which we assume is probably bison antiquus uh, on the paleo points that we're looking at. So that, that wasn't new, but certainly the, uh, the proboscidean, especially the proboscidean and the horse, that's the first, to my knowledge, that's, and we, as we discussed in the paper, that's the first uh, immunological result for that in the eastern U.S., so really, for the especially for the proboscidean, how much evidence was there before this that proboscideans were actually even present in, South, uh, present in southeast uh, United States at that time? I mean, outside of Florida uh, and maybe parts of the northeast, none. Huh. Well, that's, and, a, that's that's astounding, <laughs> really. <laughs> right. I mean, so we we you know we've been uh, you know you wind up having to rely on a lot of assumptions and stereotypes, but I, I will say after my first study from Flamingo Bay and when we didn't get any evidence of proboscidean or other extinct megafauna, I said, wow, hmm, does, you know, does, could that mean that these animals were regionally extinct in South Carolina by the time of Clovis? And so that was a driving question that I had that I certainly wanted to address with this much larger uh, study. Yeah. But to get back to the, the preservation issue, from 13,000 years ago, we just we don't have bones from that time period. It's just not there. <clears throat> We've got fossilized material that people find, you know, on the coast and the rivers. The vast majority of that, maybe all of it, is significantly older than 13,000. But we have no sites in North Carolina, South Carolina, I don't know if any in Georgia or Virginia, that have Clovis or other, you know, obviously – diagnostic, temporally diagnostic, paleo-American artifacts and direct association with the bones of extinct megafauna. That it just it's not there. Yeah. You know, I mean obviously that means something, right? Mm-hmm. Um there's something to infer there, but even also the fact that you have blood residue and as we know the you know the fossil record is largely incomplete. And it's not like we've analyzed every square foot of, you know, every yeah. uh, you know, every state or anything. But I, I think that even the fact that you find anything, even you know, at these at these sites means that they were probably fairly widespread. Even though we don't have as much evidence as we want to to say that 
did you find any at all means that, you know, they were, they were around for sure. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, right. I think that's, that's another point, you know, well taken. I think that, you know, my other, my initial question about, you know, regional extinction, I was certainly answered. I mean, these animals were around and like you say, they probably were fairly common for, you know, for me to even find five out of 120, you know, that doesn't seem like a lot. It's certainly a small percentage, but given the, the, issues with preservation and the, the low percentage that we find for anything. Right. Uh, that I, certainly suggests that they were being targeted, you know, sort of like, you know, it, you know, and were maybe were a lot of animals around certainly at least, you know, prior to extinction. Yeah, certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. So when we look at the actual artifacts themselves, I, I do want to highlight exactly what was uh, making up that 120 Uh, from North and South Carolina. So according to the paper here, we have 71 Clovis points, two unifacial scrapers, 31 early Paleo-American Hall River points. And we'll talk more about that here momentarily for those of you who may not be familiar with that point type. 11 full fluted redstone points, two Simpson points, one quad point, one Cumberland, and one Beaver Lake. So that is a pretty good, not only a sample of the blood residue across the line, but also a good sample of various paleo implements uh, from different styles. And so, Chris, my question is this. Of that uh, 71 Clovis implements, uh, or the extinct animals, were they present on those Clovis points? And do they show uh, on the other points that are uh, post-Clovis do we see anything uh, as far as transitioning into like the bovid species? As we say in the paper, we don't we don't have we didn't have enough post Clovis points. We didn't have a big enough sample of those. I think I thought we had a pretty good sample for Clovis uh, and certainly Hall River, which we can talk about. Uh, I didn't. I really would have liked to have had a much bigger sample of, for example, redstone points, which we which we assume and 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 based on some dates from Virginia. It's probably, you know, right at the very end of Clovis and then post-Clovis. But as we discuss, for the sample that, for the results that we got, we have proboscidean on Clovis points, we have, you know, and, and the other animals. We don't have proboscidean on any post-Clovis point. Redstone, quad, Cumberland, you know, none of that. Um, yeah. We do have horse we do have equidae on on redstone, but we don't have proboscidean. So, again, we don't we don't have a big enough sample to make any definitive statement about it. But I think that's one of the things that we discuss. This method may really be able to address sort of the timing, the the, the demography of extinction, and where where and when did some of these species go extinct, regardless of of what the cause was, right? We can we can talk about that too. Sure. Uh, but there's many debates about the you know the cause of these extinctions. Uh, but but I thought it was interesting enough to mention the fact that we got that we didn't get proboscidean on post Clovis points, yes. which you know, certainly starts gets the wheels turning, you know, and you start wondering, okay, you know, are we are we seeing uh, you know evidence that proboscidean go extinct? Uh, by the end of Clovis. Yeah, I mean, it's it, while you can't make that definitive statement, it certainly seems to give us some sort of indication uh, of which direction we're going. One thing that I, I do want to clarify here, again, for folks, is uh, the Hall River Point. Uh, again, that's sort of a regional thing for here in North and South Carolina. I mean, they occur, you know, in various places on the East Coast, but um, it, it's kind of a big deal around here, kind of like the Hardaway is a regional point there in North Carolina. <laughs> but uh, let's talk about the Hall River for a minute, because it's often been uh, theorized that they could be contemporary of Clovis or possibly even pre-Clovis or earlier than Clovis. So again, a study like this not only shows us, you know, things like the the residues from the blood proteins, but it also gives us some insight into earlier uh, styles of artifacts and where they may actually lie on the time scale. So tell us a little bit right. about the the Hall River and what your your findings were for the study with those particular points. Yeah, the Hall River point is certainly a really interesting point. It's been noted you know, by a lot of avocationalists, you know, more so than professional archaeologists. And there's some 
indication that it could be either coeval or earlier than Clovis, perhaps. Uh, that's there, We don't have any dates. Uh, we're hoping to find clear evidence of these in situ uh, in a stratigraphic sequence that could help answer that question. Uh, but we included them. Uh, just for example, one of the benefits of uh, looking at points made from Allendale Church in South Carolina is that it weathers with age. Uh, and so you, you just by looking at the artifact, you get an immediate clue. It's not definitive, but you you can look at the weathering of a point, and it'll tell you relatively how old the artifact is. And the one thing that we see with Hall River points found in South Carolina, um, many of them are made of coastal plain chert, and they're excessively weathered, extremely weathered. And that's true for surface finds. That's true for, for buried uh, Hall Rivers that I've seen come up in, in various collections. So, you know, we don't have dates. We don't have them in good stratified sequence yet. But there's hints that they could be quite old, which is why we included them in the blood residue study, uh, because depending on, you know, the, the animals, the, uh, either the presence or absence of extinct species might give us another clue. And, uh, and we, in fact, did get that because we, we have, you know, Hall River points uh, with proboscidean, uh, which to me, you know, puts them at least coeval. I would say, at least based on what we're what we're seeing now, it's coeval with Clovis, uh, at the very least. So, have any Hall River uh, points been found? Uh, you know, in a situation where there was uh, there was something datable, uh, you know, carbon datable, you know, contemporary with the points. Not that no, not that I know okay. of. Okay, there are there, there are some um, working without Goodyear. Uh, we do have Hall Rivers uh, from the Topper excavations. Going back okay. to the 80s, there, there, uh, uh, I was working, finding, you know, going back through these collections from much earlier excavations at Topper, and there are a number of Hall River points okay. Uh, okay. from the Topper collection. Uh, now, the best we have from that is luminescence dates, right? And we're, mm-hmm. we're hoping to, uh, to publish that. Um, I was going to probably be the lead on that paper. Hopefully, uh, fairly soon, we're going to get that out. Okay, okay. So I got, I got a couple of other questions uh, uh, about just Hall River and proboscideans and the, the extension. I don't, especially in the context of the Younger Dryas, I don't necessarily believe in like overnight extinctions without complete extinction, right? You can't right. Se- selectively overnight extinct some species and not every, you know, and not yeah. everything else. Oh, yeah. so, mm-hmm. so when you talk about, you, you mentioned earlier that, there's no proboscideans evidence after Clovis. What's the time span between Clovis and then the next thing, right? The, the next thing that we're testing uh, for blood residue, what's, what's that time span, just roughly? I mean, all we have for redstone, other than it's, um, it's a, a morphometric type, right? It, it, it's, it's a full-fluted, deeply incurvate base, fluted point that, that resembles – Gainy points, it resembles, you know, Folsom points uh, in the West. And, and so there's always been an assumption that it's post Clovis. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably a good assumption. Uh, but we don't have dates, uh, or at least in South Carolina, we don't. In Virginia, right. Joe McAvoy published in the second Cactus Hill report several dates from one or more hearth features with deeply incurvate base, full fluted points that, and I forget exactly, but they they overlap with the very end of Clovis. Interesting. Um, so we only have a few, so we don't know if these dates are good. We we know that it at least overlaps with the very end of Clovis, you know, around 12,800 years ago, mm-hmm. right? which would, you know, correspond roughly to the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Right, right. Uh, we don't know how late they go. We don't mm-hmm. know how far into the Younger Dryas, how many centuries they last, when do, when they transition to Dalton, you know, we, we think Dalton probably comes in around 12,500 years ago. Okay. So, you know, we've got four or 500 years potentially when redstone points are being made. Okay. But really at this point, we're making, we're, we're making a lot of assumptions. Sure. Yeah. And, and I, I, I think that's important for people to understand. Not only are we making assumptions, but it's just not like a 12,800 years on the precise date 
Yeah. That's when that stopped, right? There's a, right. there's, there's always these transitions, things right. move from one thing to the other, you know, environmental conditions can change, whatever it is. It's, right. it's a, it's a process and it's a kind of a slow motion type of a thing, especially in the terms of human lifespans and generations and all of that. Right. So, you know, nobody just one day just completely disappeared off the face of the earth. There was a, you know, there was a transition. Right. Now, I, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, I suspect if if I could get a large sample of redstone points from a lot of it would have to come from private collectors uh, in the state and redo this test, it would not surprise me to get proboscidian right. on some redstone points. Again, I think the issue would be, you know, how, how what you know, at what level would we necessarily see that versus close? I think there is potential to to get at using this immunological method to sort of get at the timing, at least in a broad sense. Yeah. Um, but, but it doesn't certainly the, the our results do, do, you know, don't prove that, that proboscidian were not still around and being hunted during redstone times. As we talk about some of the, the various artifacts, Chris, I do want to highlight one because as, as we record this uh, on July the 3rd, uh, you have a brand new article that's just appeared in our local media here, the Post and Courier, and it's certainly making its rounds very quickly. And it's highlighting one of the uh, artifacts that were part of this study, a Clovis knife, a rather large one at 17.5 centimeters. So tell us a little bit about the story, because this particular artifact has a story associated with it. And then also, what were the results from testing this particular piece? Yeah, that point has an incredibly interesting story. Uh, Ben Ziegler uh, who has started the uh, Archaeological Institute of the PD uh, in Florence at the Florence Museum in, in South Carolina. He actually found this artifact on the PD River in eastern South Carolina. Uh, he found the, the longer tip of the blade. Uh, and then, believe it or not, probably a little, almost a year later, went back to the site and found the broken base. Um, now, this was a f- recent break. It wasn't a prehistoric break. That's so almost the, unbelievable. I'm just it, gonna say. It really, yeah, it really I think, is. I think I speak for the group here when, like, holy smokes, that doesn't happen. <laughs> Nobody does that. Uh, right. It, it's yeah. pretty amazing. And uh, you can see the, the, dif- the differential weathering a little bit. So it's clear that it was broken. It laid there. Someone ran over it, uh, probably putting in a boat on the PD. Mm-hmm. Uh, never saw it. Uh, but there's an area there that's eroding. There's, there's, you know, artifacts washing out, eroding out. But he found this thing and, and, you know, immediately got our, our attention because, one, its size, uh, it's made out of an exotic type of chert uh, that's unlike anything I've ever seen in South Carolina and North Carolina. So that got our, our attention right away. Um, and so, so what, what's the chert look like? Just curious. I'm- it's sort of a bluish, kind of a dark, you know, bluish type chert uh okay somebody out there knows they're like oh i know what that is yeah well we need to get get more people more eyeballs on this thing to look at because it's you know it it looks like possibly a variety of you know ridge and valley maybe okay not exactly i mean there's so much variety in all of these chert types but it's nothing like um certainly nothing like cultural plane chert in south carolina Right, which is white. mostly white, right? It's kind of white. With, yeah, it's sort of a chalky, you know, yeah. white, yellow, and it weathers very differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but this thing was just incredibly large, especially when we refit the pieces together. And we weren't completely sure of the affiliation. We didn't know, what is this Is this a paleo artifact? We, we weren't sure. It has some fairly deep invasive flakes that come across the blade, doesn't you know? It doesn't have flakes that go all the way across the way you see on some Clovis points. It has basal thinning. Uh, you'll see on the drawing that sort of looked like a small flute or an attempt at fluting. It has a setup on the base as if they were potentially prepared to flute the artifact, uh, but it was never fluted in a classic Clovis you know type style that we that we would recognize immediately. And frankly, looking at it in, in my hand, I think it would have broken. I think, you know, probably there was a good reason why they didn't do any more basal thinning or fluting of this point. It was very thin, very long, very thin. 
Um, so, you know, with that in mind, we still didn't know really for sure, uh, but we, we included it in the blood residue analysis, and it was one of the five points that came back with proboscidium. Now, that's interesting. Yeah. Because you would not think of cerem- – well, maybe you would think a ceremonial blade would be used in some context with this, but that's – huh. Yeah, that was that was quite the shock. And, but, huh. uh, I'm kind of shocked. <laughs> well, again, I mean, not, not kidding. People, right? I mean, in so many ways. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Chris, you really did a great job of breaking down this particular point. Now, there's some great graphics in the paper that are there for everyone to see. And uh, I just want to read from this, the microware analysis on this particular artifact, uh, not only does it show that proboscidean association and also uh, through its uh, style and manufacture of the uh, Clovis era, but a lot of other uh, things were able to be noticed through that microware analysis. Uh, So it has uh, locations of hafting traces. You have micro impact fracture with bone polish, sheath wear. Uh, there's basal thinning, post depositional fractures, uh, butchery, and positive results uh, from the CIEP study, which you just uh, told us about the proboscidean. Right. So, even though it may have been discarded, nonetheless, it was obviously used to some degree for those micro wear analysis to be present. So, uh, yeah. again, this is something that. You know, this study is covering so many areas uh, other than just its main primary goal of the blood residue analysis, uh, the blood protein that is, but look how much more you're able to learn by examining these artifacts. So, uh, you know, I I really appreciate the fact that everyone uh, that you involved with the team that you included this and the pictures are fantastic. You really did a great job of zooming in and you'll be able to see all of these areas that are highlighted when you go over there and check out that paper at nature.com. So as we, uh, kind of begin to wrap up here for the uh, the evening let's talk about some of the conclusions that you came to so after looking at 120 paleo implements uh, artifacts uh, scrapers a couple of those in there various styles uh, various blood residues what are the team's conclusions as far as the study itself and the possibility for future studies well i think you know we probably covered it you know in general i think you know uh, several questions, I think, were answered. I mean, in terms of my r- original question about whether or not these animals were present when closed people, in particular, were here, we'll leave off for the for the time being. We'll leave off the pre-Clovis possibilities for whole river, but certainly, you know, the, we know that you know based on the study, they, these animals were here. They weren't. They weren't extinct. They were around. They were being hunted. They were being butchered. They were being scavenged. You know, any of those are possibilities. You know, all animals that died in, in other ways, they didn't have to, you know, have been killed. Uh, but they they certainly were being butchered uh, by, you know, early Paleo-Americans, and, and certainly with reference to proboscidean and horse and bison being, again, clear evidence of a very heavy focus on bison. Uh, that's just something that we see in several of the studies, both published and unpublished that I've done is the clear uh, preference maybe for what must have been um, likely large herds of bison, bison antiquus uh, that were in the, in the Carolinas at that time. But, you know, they were here, they were being hunted. uh, And again, we mentioned, you know, we need a much bigger sample of post Clovis points to perhaps get at what is the timing of extinction. And we, suggest that future work would be just that, would be get looking at much a larger sample of post clovis points from the Carolinas and from surrounding states to get at, potentially, with a large enough sample to get at broadly the timing of, of elite extinction, if not extinction, extirpation, right, the, the removal from the region. Not so that there might have been proboscidiums in, you know, in, in other states, but uh, maybe they, there was a time during at the end of Clovis where they're essentially extinct in, in South Carolina. We, we can't say that yet, but that's a possibility. Just a question. So, you know, when we think about Southeast United States, we think largely about pine forests, right? But when we think about bovids or uh, large uh, herds of bison, we think about open plains and grasslands and all of that. What what really was the kind of ecological setting uh, in the Southeast United States pre 
uh, younger drives, you know, at the uh, coming down the last glacial maximum that lasts, you know, 10,000 years or so. And before, you know, before we come into the Holocene, yeah. what did it look like really? I, you know, I think from the evidence we have from pollen studies, you know, by the time you get to around the time of close 14,000, 13,000, you're really looking at essentially a modern environment with a legacy of an ice age ecosystem, right? It, it during the LGM 20,000 years ago, you know, we had very different climate conditions. We had at White Pond in South Carolina, they talk about jack pine and spruce, and mm-hmm. we had much, very open, uh, um, far fewer trees, uh, grasslands, sand dunes blowing around everywhere. So very different then. But by the time Clovis comes in the picture, you know, maybe if we have pre-Clovis around, maybe that maybe they're getting into this earlier Ice Age climate that was very different. But by the time of Clovis, uh, we're generally looking at modern – Holocene conditions. Okay. Okay. Because, um, you know, well, even at White Pond, I mean, White Pond exists because that's a, you know, kind of a large dune feature, right? Yeah, and right. dune features don't form unless you've kind of got some, you know, some more open territory. It's not, you know, yeah. deciduous or, or coniferous, uh, coniferous trees like we have now in South Carolina. Yeah. Um, it's more of a kind of a grassland or sort of a, you know, more arid type environment. Right. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, how conducive would the coastal plain have been for mega herbivores? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I think there's other experts that could talk to, could speak to that, but I think we do have the coastal plain is quite rich and, and in terms of the diversity, right? You can have the, the high areas. Well, the Xeric sands with the long leaf pines, and then you go, go down slope into a stream and you, you get into hardwoods, you know, right. acid trees and hickory nuts. And uh, huh. so, quite a diversity within the coastal plain. And Certainly. I suspect that there would have been plenty of areas uh, for at least, you know, some populations of mega herbivores up until, you know, certainly until the 13,000 years ago. Certainly. Yeah. I think, I think I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Again, just adding to the overall knowledge of the Carolinas and mm-hmm. everywhere else as well. Again, an absolutely fascinating topic of discussion. I'm so happy to have you back here on the show, Chris. Uh, Again, this article is open access. It was published on the 10th of June at Scientific Reports. You can find it at nature.com. Again, titled Paleo-American Exploitation of Extinct Megafauna Revealed Through Immunological Blood Residue and Microware Analysis, North and South Carolina, USA. And if you're looking for it online, it will be article number 9464, uh, volume 13 of Scientific Reports. I just want to highlight some of the co-authors. Again, Christopher Moore is the lead author, but also Larry Kimball, Albert Goodyear, Mark Brooks, Randy Daniel, and Alan West, Sean Taylor, Kirsten Weber, John Fagan, and Cam Walker. And uh, Chris, I know that you have a uh, special shout out there for Larry Kimball. So uh, let's do that now. Yeah, I just wanted to certainly acknowledge all of my co-authors for their contribution. Larry, uh, you talk about some of the wonderful figures, uh, the microware evidence for the for this incredible uh, knife that was found. Uh, Larry, Larry Kimball did all of that. And so I want to certainly express a pre- appreciation to him and all of my co-authors and certainly Sean Taylor and uh, others who work with the Department of Natural Resources and the South Carolina Heritage Trust Program made uh, really all of this work possible. You know, so in addition to my, my uh, capacity with the University of uh, South Carolina, uh, the Department of Natural Resources uh, were, were integral to making this work happen. Yeah, it's always great to have uh, everybody working together, uh, different groups and agencies all on the same page making things happen. We've been speaking tonight with Dr. Christopher Moore, research professor at the South Carolina Institute for Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of South Carolina. As always, one of our favorite guests, Chris, thanks again for joining us here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Glad to be here. Well, this is a fascinating topic. I'm loving the way that we're seeing uh, new technology, new things that is pushing archaeology forward. Now, as Chris mentioned, this has actually been around for quite a while, this type of testing, but to see it used in this way to me is especially exciting. So again, we thank Chris Moore for joining us. He is a great friend and a wonderful mentor to all of us here at Seven Ages, and it's always a great pleasure catching up with him. 
Oh, it really is. And again, I miss Chris. We haven't seen him since before COVID. In fact, actually, as the pandemic was making landfall in North America, guess where the three of us were? We'd been right down there at White Pond. In fact, one of the very last meals I had before we all went into lockdown had been, I believe, at a restaurant with you guys. As we were making our way away from the site, I think we dropped James off at a airport, and then we made our way back up to North Carolina, where Jason and I both resided at the time. I got home, plans were swiftly canceled, and I didn't leave my house for several days, and the world changed. But again, if you really put this in context, we look back to the Pleistocene, we look at the kinds of animals that were being hunted, and what these new blood protein analyses have revealed, and it shows us that humans, if there's one thing we've always done, we've always gone through periods of change, and we've always endured. Unfortunately, those Pleistoceners didn't have a cross-time pub, though, to keep them fueled and to cool them off when temperatures got as hot as they have been here in the southeast in recent days. So, gentlemen, as is always the case, I'd like to invite you now to join me, and maybe we will re-up for one more round before we head on back to our libraries, laboratories, and layers. What do you say? I'm already there, and you know, Micah, maybe they did have a cross-time pub. You don't know. Yeah, you don't know until you don't know. I'm going to see if next, after blood protein analysis, they will do some sort of an analysis of the different potential beverages that might have been imbibed in the ancient Americas. That would be a real heck of a research study. Maybe we'll have to propose that. Maybe we'll even conduct that study ourselves. In the meantime, you guys can do some studying over at 7ages.org. Get caught up on all of our back catalog. And if indeed you are new to the program, you've got a lot of listening to do. On behalf of Jason Pentrail, James Waldo, and of course, I am Micah Hanks. We are the Seven Ages Research Associates, and we'll catch you next time right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Oh.